Good morning, everyone. My name is Lauren Roberts. Um, thank you so much for having me this morning. I'm really, really excited to kind of share with you my journey um, from high school all the way to where I am now um, and the challenges that I faced, um, how to overcome them, and just what to kind of expect as a graduate student or someone that's thinking of pursuing or doing something in research. So to get started, I just wanted to go over the overview of my project, so or the overview of my talk, which will just be to tell you a little bit about my journey to graduate school. And then once I tell you about my journey, I will go into what I'm actually studying, what I'm actually doing here at the University of UF. Okay. So um, to start with, I wanted to give you some background about who I am. I am a homeschooler. Um, I am from New York. Um, not this New York, which everybody tends to think when I tell them, but I'm actually from upstate New York, up here. Um, a lot of people told me I was Canadian. I'm not. Um, but I am very, very close to Canada, like an hour and a half away. Um, but being a homeschooler kind of presented several challenges um, that I didn't foresee when I was becoming a college student. Um, so they might not be exactly <laughs> challenges that you might have faced, but just to um, give you some context of what I, what I had to overcome in order to become successful in my undergraduate career. So with that being said, I want to start with my journey. Um, so I was always fascinated as a kid um, with microbiology and just biology in general, but I was raised by parents who were engineers. <laughs> So my parents loved math um, way more than I did and didn't really understand my fascination with um, looking at leaves or looking at bark or why I was trying to catch butterflies or look at their wings. Um, so I was uh, very odd <laughs> in the way that I viewed the world compared to my parents. Um, I was just, yeah, I wanted a microscope by the time I was six to look at things more closely to see like if I could see little compartments in cells. Um, and when I was eight, I finally convinced my parents to get myself a microscope. Um, it might surprise you, but this is actually pretty normal for graduate students in my, um, at least in my program, BMS. Almost everybody in my program had a microscope when they were five years old um, or eight because they were just so fascinated with what was around them. Um, but when I was a kid, if you had asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, it would not have been a PhD student. I had no idea what that even was as a kid. Um, if you had asked me, I probably would have said astronaut because I love the stars, or a doctor because I liked helping people, or a cook because I liked cooking in the kitchen with my mom. But it was definitely, I, did, I definitely did not foresee um, becoming a PhD student. Um, but I became more and more interested in biology and just life sciences in general as a high school student um, and loved anatomy and physiology and cell biology. So I had a feeling that I would end up somewhere in the health field, but I just didn't really know where. Um, as an undergraduate, I really, really wanted to go to a four-year university. <laughs> um, and I thought that's what was going to be the best choice for me, that it would help me later in life, but my parents really thought that the greatest start for me would be a community college, especially with my history of being a homeschool student. Um, it probably would have been a little bit more of a shock going from being homeschooled from first grade to 12th um, to just jumping with both feet into a four-year university, like somewhere far away that I didn't know. Um, so I ended up going to a community college called Monroe Community College, um, which was 30 minutes from where I grew up. Um, so I was pretty close to home um, and close to a support system when I started college. Um, I, it was the best experience of my life. I absolutely loved it. And if it was a four-year college, I would have stayed <laughs> in a heartbeat. Um, I learned uh, to, like, where I was, wanted to be in research at this school um, and even what research was at this school, um, as well as becoming a student athlete, which came with its challenges of trying to learn how to balance um, and time manage everything with studies as well as games and traveling. Um, so Monroe Community College was, um, yeah, one of the greatest experiences of my life and something I will always carry with me. So um, although I absolutely loved my experience at MCC, I and underwent a lot of challenges and a lot of uh, people, I guess, questioning my ability. Um, when I, before I even enrolled in classes, when I was just applying to the college itself. 
Um, no one believed that I had actually earned my grades, <laughs> um, which is a common problem that you seem to have with homeschool students. Um, nobody really truly thinks that what you're putting on paper is what you're doing because they think it's really easy for you to fudge your grades or that your parents can write them in for you. And unfortunately, there are cases where people will do that, and I do know people that have done that, um, but my family was not one of them. <laughs> so it was very frustrating to be, um, to have been assumed um, that what I did was not what I, I had actually earned. Um, so it started with this woman, um, <laughs> Mary Lynch, in the administrative office when I first applied, and just came in to talk to her because she had a lot of questions when I was trying to enroll. Um, and she was like, why do you expect me to believe that you got these? Like, you have nothing to show that you actually earned these grades. And I looked her in the eye and I was like, I've taken regents exams, which I don't know if Florida has regents exams, but it's a, it's a kind of milestone that you take per like whatever area you're studying, whether it's history, biology, chemistry, and you take an exam to kind of place you or show how much you've learned in this subject and how much you should have learned by whatever grade you're in. Um, so I took regents exams to show my progress um, when I was in grade school, as well as taking standardized tests, which is also another method of how I had to show I was actually progressing and doing what I needed to do and lear learning what I needed to learn in homeschooling. So even with my regents grades, <laughs> even with my standardized testing scores, um, it was still a really big challenge for people to believe that I had actually earned the grades that I did. Um, so I had to actually be placed um, in, like, take a placement test in order to show that I actually deserved to be in the classes that I said I wanted to take, um, which was really frustrating and kind of discouraging to be like, okay, I'm, I'm not even in college yet, and I thought I was going to be in a four-year college, and even in this community college, which I thought would be something that would be easier to get into, which was a yeah, a big misconception in, on my part. Um, I was already challenged with who I was and my ability to learn. So um, during my freshman year, <laughs> I thought I wanted to be a physical therapist. <laughs> I was very convinced um, because I loved helping people. I loved being around people, interacting with them. Um, but after playing one year as a um, student athlete, and becoming injured and having to go through physical therapy, I realized I didn't want to have to mentor or treat somebody that would be like me in physical therapy. Um, I was very bad at doing exercises and would show up like every two weeks and be like, why am I not getting better? And it was because I wasn't doing my exercises, which would be infuriating if <laughs> I had to deal with that. So I decided to switch my major from pre-med, which is what I was taking, or the track that I was taking to get to PT and went into biology. Um, so this is just kind of a diagram to kind of give you an idea of how I felt after I finished high school. And if you haven't heard this yet, um, during undergrad you probably will hear it, that your progress to your goal is not, not linear at all. Um, there's tons of peaks, tons of valleys. You will change your mind multiple times. Um, it's, yeah, not linear, and honestly, I haven't even gotten to these changes in my occupation or changes in my jobs. I've only been in this first half, and it's been a, a crazy <laughs> whirlwind. <laughs> so, so um, I, during my sophomore year, I was, I think I was actually in a biology class, and I got a phone call from my mom saying that my sister and her were on the, emergen or on the way to the emergency room because they had just gotten attacked by a swarm of bees. Um, and it was uh, pretty scary um, because my parents, my, my family is pretty well renowned to have bad allergies. Um, so we thought that one of them was going to go into anaphylactic shock. Um, but as a result of the um, attack from the bees, my sister developed an autoimmune disease. And I don't really know if any of you know what an autoimmune disease was, because I had no idea what it was when the doctors told me. Um, does anybody know what an autoimmune disease is by any chance? Yeah. So an autoimmune disease um, is when your immune system, which is supposed to be, which is built into your body to protect you from diseases, from pathogens, actually turns on you in a way and treats your body and your cells as something that it has to defend against. So instead of looking at bacteria or viruses and being like, you don't belong here, let me attack you and get rid of you, it actually looks at your own cells and it's like, you don't belong here, this is not me, I need to get rid of this. So 
um, because my sister was diagnosed with an unknown autoimmune disease, they still don't know what it is. They just know that her body's attacking itself. Um, it raised a lot of questions <laughs> for me on what autoimmunity was, um, what that meant that my sister's body was attacking her, what was involved in that, and what made the change in that. So during my second semester of my sophomore year, I ended up um, taking a microbiology class with this professor called, um, named Professor Wickham, um, who is right here. <laughs> and um, I, I nagged him so much with the amount of questions that I asked him based on bacteria, based on viruses, and based on the immune system. I was just like, I just don't understand like, why my sister is going through this. Um, and so uh, because of the amount of questions that I <laughs> asked him, um, he thought that I should do a summer internship. Um, and without me knowing, he actually ended up signing me up for a symposium on the Bridges to Baccalaureate program and then started an application for me to the Bridges to Baccalaureate program at a school because he was like, this is really for you. I think you would do great in research, um, even though I really had no idea what that was. <laughs> so. After graduating with my AAS, which was my Associates in Arts and Science from Monroe Community College, I went to the Bridges to Baccalaureate program at Binghamton University, which is still in New York. So um, during the summer of 2015, I um, started this Bridges to Baccalaureate program. Um, it was in the Marquez lab. This is Claudia right here. Um, this was my boss. She was German and a little scary at times, <laughs> but she was a really great teacher. Um, and this is my Bridges group um, that I did my summer internship with. Um, but my time at, during the Bridges to Baccalaureate program, um, I learned what graduate school could look like since I worked under a graduate student. Um, I did a lot of research in biofilms. Um, and the reason why I chose to do research in biofilms, um, they contain bacteria. Um, so all biofilms have bacteria. They're like these little communities um, of bacteria that kind of grow together and communicate together. And since I was in a microbiology class with Dr. Wakeham, and he, like that was part of the reason why I thought I wanted to go into research. Um, I wanted to start and wanted to see what bacteria actually was. Like microbiology was great, but what what do, what do you do with it in research? I didn't know. So I joined this lab um, and. Claudia's lab was involved in trying to effecti effectively treat or cure chronic diseases that were caused by bacteria um, or bacterial biofilms um, because there's a little part of the community that will always stay there. They're called persister cells. Like even if you treat somebody with a ton of antibiotic and wipe out all of the bacteria in that biofilm, there's always a little bit left behind that kind of hides from the immune system so they don't clear it out. Um, and then once it realized that all of the other cells in its community are gone, they start to wake up and remake the biofilm. Um, so it's really hard to get rid of a chronic disease. So that's part of the reason why I was so interested in trying to learn more about this disease. But during this program, I discovered that I really liked research. <laughs> um, I, I had a ton of fun. It was only eight weeks, um, but they flew by. And I actually asked to stay longer. <laughs> Um, so they let me stay four weeks longer to continue research just because I loved it so much. Um, I built a community through the Bridges to Baccalaureate program. I still keep in contact with a lot of these people. Um, they've been great when I'm looking for um, advice or if I am not, if I'm trying to look into an area that I'm not an expert in, which I'm not an expert in anything right now, but um, they give, they've been helpful in giving me guidance um, even though we're still kind of in the same area of life. Um, but I fell in love with microbiology through this program, and it was just an overall fantastic experience for me um, and really set my path in deciding to pursue a PhD. So um, after the Bridges to Baccalaureate program, I started at my four-year college um, and completed my junior and senior years there. And I went to Nazareth College, which was still in Rochester, New York, just like Monroe Community College and where I grew up. <laughs> Um, but um, even when I transferred over to Nazareth, I still received criticism and doubts from a lot of the faculty about why I was there and if science was really the right path for me. 
um, which was kind of shocking and a little discouraging because I was like, I have the grades to prove that I belong here, so why don't you believe I belong here? Um, but uh, in the summer um, or in the fall, between um, right before I started college at Nazareth, um, I actually went through a traumatic experience. So what the faculty did not know at Nazareth College was that I was dealing with anxiety, depression, and a ton of other effects from a traumatic event that happened during that fall semester. Um, and I wasn't comfortable sharing that because I didn't know these people. Um, so uh, when I would have to get up in the middle of class, they thought it was because I was being lazy, not because I was in the middle of a panic attack or um, like little things like that. So it was just kind of um, discouraging when I first got to the school because I was like, I'm really trying here, but like it, to them it looked like I wasn't because I was dealing with something on top of um, just my normal curriculum. But this woman, um, Lynn O'Brien, she was the woman I did research with while I was at um, my four year, um, was just really encouraging and a really good mentor. Um, and could see that there was something else like that was happening in my personal life that like even though I didn't um, share the entire thing with her like she realized like you know you're really trying here and I really think that you can um, still progress and do well in research. Um, so I gained a lot of research experience in working with E. coli which I don't know if um, any of you are familiar with but that's I mean like Chipotle and romaine lettuce, like whenever there's an outbreak like that's it's from E. coli. So, um, but during my time at Nazareth College, um, after graduating with my bachelor's in science and biology, um, as well as like minor in chemistry and philosophy, I realized I didn't really want to work with bacteria. Like they were really cool, but um, I noticed that I was more interested in how our bodies were affected by the, the pathogen, um, not necessarily the bacteria itself. So um, I knew I wanted to go to graduate school, um, but I didn't think that I had enough research experience or really knew where I wanted to go. Um, so I decided to take a year off and started looking for opportunities to gain that research experience. Um, and uh, what I found was this PrEP program at the University of Rochester. So PrEP stands for Post-Baccalaureate Research Education Program. Um, it's something that's offered through the University of Rochester. Again, still Rochester, New York, so still in the same general area of where I grew up. Um, but it simulated the first year of graduate school. So they had you take graduate level courses. Um, you were responsible for working full time in a lab and doing research in whatever lab you chose. But on top of the first year graduate school simulation, I was also responsible for studying for the GRE, taking the GRE, as well as hosting symposiums, um, hosting events, and a lot of other administrative stuff that I, like, at the time was like, well, this is so much, but it ended up being, coming a really big help for me where I am now. Um, but when I was at the prep program, I ended up um, researching in this guy's lab, Steve Dewhurst. Um, I did not want to go in a virus lab. I thought that viruses were boring, <laughs> um, and I didn't really see any point. I wanted to be in an immunology lab, um, and so I was very adamant. Um, I had to make a list of the people I wanted to um, research with, and Steve was at the very bottom, <laughs> and somehow I ended up in his lab. Um, and the Dewhurst lab studies flu viruses, so. Um, they work on host pathogen interactions um, where we're trying to, or where they were trying to develop a new vaccine that was more effective than the vaccine that we usually get. So there is a live attenuated vaccine, which is what you get shot up your nose, like through a nasal spray. And then there is the inactivated vaccine, which is what you actually get in your arm. So my work in Steve's lab was to try to develop a vaccine that would be more effective, but safer, that was inhaled. Because in the past, like the reason why we still get the in-arm shots is because the LAIV, the live attenuated vaccine, was like still too, like it wasn't as safe as it needed to be. So my job was to try to figure that out. And it was in Steve's lab <laughs> that I realized I wanted to go into virology. I fell in love with viruses. Um, they were just, really fun puzzles, like constantly moving, constantly mutating, and it was just a constant challenge. 
um, and I really enjoyed it. So I decided to pursue a PhD in virology. And so um, I applied to several different colleges for graduate school, kind of all over the place, especially since I had been born and raised in Rochester, New York, did my undergrad in Rochester, New York, did my post-baccalaureate research program in Rochester, New York, and the bridge to baccalaureate program was still in New York. So I just, I felt like I needed to get out of New York to be able to grow um, personally, but also to show that I could be successful and still do well in a place that is not my home. So. Um, when I was accepted to both University of Rochester and University of Florida, it was a, it was a really, really hard choice. I uh, trying to decide whether or not I was going to stay um, in this lab that I fell in love with, with the um, flu virus research that we were doing, or if I wanted to kind of go very far out of my comfort zone um, down south to a place where I didn't really know many people. I had some family, but not tons. Um, but uh, I, when I applied to University of Florida, I also applied for the Bridges to Doctorate program. Um, they kind of brought it up in my uh, application because I was a minority, um, but I applied for it and um, once I got accepted to the University of Florida, I actually got um, the NSF Fellowship Award as well. Um, and I was only eligible because I did the Bridge to Baccalaureate program <laughs> in my undergrad. Um, so I was very thankful to Dr. Wakeham for that opportunity. Um, but I ended up choosing to come to UF because I believed it was the place that I would grow the most. Um, and so far, I have grown a lot. So, <laughs> um, so my first year as a bridge to baccalaureate or bridge to doctorate um, fellow, um, it really helps you grow professionally. Um, so if you guys decide that you want to um, go into research and think that you might want to go into um, get your PhD then or even your master's this is a really good opportunity um, just because they they're really invested in making sure that you are ready professionally as well as personally to enter whatever world you're going to go into post PhD so um, they offered several different career development seminars um, to navigate graduate school, so like <laughs> how to even get through graduate school, but also in my first year they were still giving us um, symposiums and workshops on what to do now to prepare yourself for actually going out um, of graduate school after you exit with your PhD. Um, they really encourage you to get involved in your community as well. Um, since the Bridge to Doctorate Fellowship um, requires that you apply again, after your two years of funding, they ask you to reapply for this new fellowship called the NSF GFRP, um, which is funding for your last three years of your PhD. And um, so when you're in your first couple years with this fellowship, they really ask you to start working up your CV and really starting to get involved in figuring out where you want to be. Do you want to be in academia? Do you want to be in industry? Like to try to get yourself acclimated to where you want to be or where you think you want to end up. So um, another great thing about this fellowship is that it just sets you apart from several different ap applicants. Like there's very, there's several people that apply for this fellowship, but only if you get chosen. Um, so it's really, really helpful when you're applying for grants, fellowships, or a job application. Um, it just, it shows that, or so I've been told <laughs> by um, post fellows or um, alum that like they've been, even before they show up for their interview, they are, people already have an image of you as like a hard worker, as somebody that gives back to their community, as somebody that is really driven in a certain aspect, whether that be going to academia or industry. Um, so it's just, it's a really great program if you guys decide that you would like to go to graduate school for your PhD. So this kind of brings me now to my research, um, to what I'm doing now at the University of Florida. Um, so I work in the Toth lab um, and our lab studies KSHV, which I'll go into what KSHV is, but it is a virus and it is a herpes virus. Um, so before I get into what KSHV is, I wanted to start a, with a little bit of background um, just because I know 
not all of you are probably virologists <laughs> or cell biologists even. Um, so every cell in your body contains DNA. Um, so this is like a diagram of a cell and then inside that cell there's a nucleus and that nucleus contains all of your genetic information that is stored as chromosomes which is just a, another word for very 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 tightly wound DNA. Um, so if you were to unwind the chromosome which is what this diagram is showing um, you have different regions but that doesn't really matter all I really want you to get is that when you unwind your chromosome it is made up of just very 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 tightly wound DNA so um, so DNA is double stranded in our cells and in DNA there's these specific messages called genes um, so like each of these regions you might consider a gene um, and our cells take these genes and they read it and they decide to what to do with that message. So um, the issue is is that in the form of DNA, it's not the it's not a message that your cells can understand. So it has to be transcribed into something else. So uh, the best way to describe it is if you were trying to if you had a cookbook and you were trying to cook something, but the cookbook was written in Hebrew. And so you had to sit down and try to figure out how on earth am I supposed to make a salad, I don't know, something from a Hebrew cookbook when I can't understand the words. So that's kind of what DNA is. And transcription would be if somebody who was able to speak or read Hebrew um, and write Hebrew was able to look at the cookbook and transcribe it from Hebrew to English so that you were able to understand what you had to do to make whatever meal. So that message will get transcribed in the cell's case from DNA to RNA. And so that RNA turns into this code that the cell can now understand and there's certain proteins in your cell that are able to read this message and produce protein. So this would be like you finally being able to make your salad or whatever your meal because you finally understand what you have to do in order to make it. So um, my, my lab works a lot on DNA, RNA, and protein. Um, but in the case of KSHB, which is N another name for Kaposi sarcoma associated herpes virus. Um, it's a large double stranded DNA virus. So it has the same kind of DNA that our cells are made up of. Um, and it has to undergo the same processes to actually become this. It has to transcribe its DNA into RNA so that our cells turn its message RNA into the protein that it needs to make more of itself. So, um, KSHV is part of this herpes viridae family, so it's a herpes virus. Um, and there's three families, or three su subfamilies of herpes viridae. Um, there's the alpha subfamily, which you guys might be familiar with, somebody having it or you having it yourself, because it'll show up as a cold sore. Um, so it's HSV1 or herpes simplex virus 1 that gives you a cold sore. Or if you haven't had a cold sore or know someone that has a cold sore, you probably knew somebody that had chicken pox, which is also a herpes virus. Um, so that's a subfamily alpha herpes virus. And then there's a beta herpes virus, which is CMV or cytomegalovirus, and that can cause congenital defects or birth defects. So it can cause deafness or blindness or other kind of complications in development in utero um, if you're infected with this virus. And then my virus, or what my lab studies, um, are gamma herpes, vi gamma herpes viruses, which are KSHV, EBV, so Kaposi sarcoma herpes associated virus, or, monon or um, Epstein-Barr virus. And so gamma herpes viruses are known to either severely um, debilitate your immune system or cause cancer. So gamma herpes viruses are also called oncogenic viruses because if you're infected with them and if your immune system weakens or shuts down, then you will likely develop the cancer, Kaposi sarcoma, from this virus. 
Um, so the virus is transmitted sexually and non-sexually, so through the saliva, um, and that's actually the main route, is orally through the saliva, not sexually. Um, but this is true of all other herpes viruses as well. And then there's several diseases that my virus causes, coma um, is one of them. And then primary fusion, info, effusion lymphoma, which is um, the only two that are like really important to what I study. Um, but coma is what I'm showing here. You get m multiple lesions and nodules under your skin um, from the virus. Um, but also primary effusion lymphoma. Um, you know, I talked about our immune system and how there's like certain cells that identify like what's not you and what is you. And primary effusion lymphoma is when one of those cells, which are these B cells, end up becoming cancerous because they're infected with the virus. Um, so primary effusion lymphoma is a B cell lymphoma. It's a B cell cancer. So one of your immune cells is pretty much down for the count. Um, so like all herpes viruses, my virus has a biphasic life cycle, which means there's two different phases of its life cycle. It's either latent, which means that it's dormant pretty much, like our uh, immune system can't detect it, or it's lytic, which means it's actively replicating and actively making more of itself. Um, and like all herpes viruses, KSHV also causes lifelong infection. And to this date, there are no vaccinations um, available for any of the herpes, herpes viruses, except for chickenpox. So um, I wanted to just bring this back <laughs> because I am going to start talking about um, proteins. And my research is mainly based on proteins right now. Um, so. It's, it's going to become more apparent in the next slide, but I just want you to guys, guys to keep this in mind that DNA turns to RNA, which is the message that our cells can read to turn our RNA into proteins. So, um, KSHV infects a decent amount of people. Um, it's, not, it's not super prevalent like H HSV-1, like herpes virus that causes the cold sores. Um, but it's still, like a lot of people are still exposed to KSHV, even if they don't actually end up having Kaposi sarcoma later in their life. Um, and it's most prevalent in Africa, um, where you see a, a ton of people, like 60% of, of the population are exposed to KSHV, um, but um, not everybody that has KSHV will also develop Kaposi sarcoma. So it's still very prevalent, even though it's not as widespread or um, what we call ubiquitous, so not as common as HSV-1, it's still um, pretty widespread. So um, going back to the KSHV biophasic life cycle, I said that it has a dormant state, so a, a state where it's not replicating, where our body can't detect it. But there is a way if you want to, sorry, um, reactivate or cause the virus to become actively replicating. Um, Either in a lab setting, you can use chemicals to kind of wake the virus up from its dormant state, or in an actual human being, your immune system would become weakened either by um, HIV or AIDS or a different cancer or some other kind of really massive stressor that's going to cause your immune system to really, really weaken so that it's not able to defend against any kind of pathogens. So, and when that happens, the virus will become awakened um, and it'll start replicating and making t tons of itself to go on and infect other cells. Um, and this usually takes two to three days from when you awaken the virus to when it actually starts becoming produced. So my lab, like I said, studies KSHV. And um, recently in our lab, we were asking the question, in every cell at the gene level, so at the DNA level, what happens to the cell when the virus becomes awakened? Like what gets, does, are there genes that get turned on? Are there genes that get turned off? What happens when this virus gets reactivated or when it becomes actively um, replicating? So one thing that they found um, in this humongous screen where they were looking at like every single gene in a cell and seeing whether or not it was up or down, um, based on um, when the virus was asleep or dormant and when it was active. And they found that this protein or this gene, ID2, was 
really quickly downregulated by six hours post-induction, which when I say induction, I mean chemically forcing the virus to wake up in a cell line that's latently infected or has dormant virus in it. Oh, okay, so this is not, you didn't, they didn't take like blood from people that were no, 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 you don't, cell line. you don't take human samples. I'll go into a, yeah. a slide with like an actual, like how I did this. But yeah, it's not human samples that we're using. This is in a lab setting with um, what we call PEL cells. So I told you that KSHV causes primary fusion lymphoma or PEL. So we use cells from primary fusion lymphoma that is from a patient, but is adapted to a lab that we grow up. Um, like we don't take live human samples constantly, it's just a cancer cell line that we're able to maintain. Um, and then we look at what happens to the virus in those cells because it's clinically relevant to the, since lots of patients tend to develop the disease. So um, before I get into the results that I got, <laughs> um, the one of the main assays that I use or one of the way, main ways that I analyze my data is through Western blots. So I wanted to go through and like show you guys what Western blots are, but this is taking the protein. So after the DNA message has been transcribed into RNA, and then that RNA message has been made into protein, like this, this assay will look at the protein that has been made based on the gene level that's present. So what you end up doing is isolating cells um, and these cells, again, are usually lab-adapted cells, so some type of cancerous cell line that we have in our lab um, that is usually latently infected with KSHV, so something that has dormant virus in it. And what you end up doing, sorry, is you'll end up lysing these cells with this detergent called SDS, as well as a chemical called beta mercaptanol but all you need to know is that it lyses the cells and it causes them to de denature when you add heat to the protein. So um, a lot of the proteins in our body have secondary and tertiary structures, which just means that they're very um, globular, like they're not just this linear form of a protein, like there's a structure to it in order for it to actually work. Um, but when you add heat, you're taking away that structure and making it linear so that when you run your samples on a gel, you're able to separate your protein by size. And the reason why that's important is because you want to be able, based on what literature says, so what people have already shown, you want to be able to find whatever protein you're looking at by its size to see what happens to it if you treat it with a drug or if you cause a stress to happen, like reactivating a virus in a cell. So what you end up doing is you run your samples that have been denatured on a gel, separate your proteins by size, and then you will end up transferring your protein onto this solid membrane. Um, it's kind of like paper, but it's a special kind of paper. It's called a cellulose membrane. And then after that, you're able to analyze the protein and look at what happens to whatever protein of interest you have based on a uh, certain treatment. So, a lot of people use it to observe changes in protein expression. Um, after you treat a certain cell with a drug, um, after a certain stress you apply to a cell, um, or if you actually cause a certain protein to be overexpressed, what happens to the other parts or proteins of the cell? So um, going back to this, the main question that we were asking after getting these results that when you wake the virus up from a dormantly infected cell and seeing that this gene, ID2, was rapidly downregulated, um, why does the virus have to downregulate it in order to reactivate? Like, what is the importance of this gene? So in order to understand that, we looked at what the protein's normal function was. So I'm just bringing this back as a reminder of like what, how protein is made. Um, but we looked at, in healthy cells, what does this protein do? So ID2 is an inhibitor of DNA binding protein. So all you need to know is that this protein, ID2, this pink protein, when DNA is trying to be tra transcribed or when a gene is trying to be transcribed from DNA to a messenger RNA to make protein, this protein will inhibit certain transcription proteins from being able to turn your gene into a message that your, protein, that your cell can read to make protein. So um, it's really important for your immune cells. So if you want 
to have healthy B cells or T cells, you need this protein ID2 to be functional um, in order for your immune cells and your body to be healthy. So the role of this protein, though, hasn't been studied in the context of the virus I look at, KSHV. So um, we, based on what we knew that ID2, um, this inhibitor DNA protein, tends to bind to other proteins and prevent them from transcribing or turning other genes into proteins um, or being expressed. We hypothesize that ID2 prevents the reactivation of KSHV um, by using this negative regulatory um, function, which negative regulatory just means like it's, it's preventing something from happening instead of allowing something to happen. Um, so the way that we study this hypothesis was through asking two questions. Um, what happens during reactivation? Um, so what happens when you wake the virus up from dormantly infected cells? Um, and then what happens if we overexpress this protein? So if we overexpress ID2, what happens to the virus? Will it prevent the virus from being able to wake up and be able to act actively replicate itself? What's going to happen if we add so much protein that the virus isn't able to shut it down? So um, what happens when the virus, oops, what happens when ID2, uh, or what happens to ID2 when KSHV is reactivated, excuse me. So I wanted to bring this back, but this is just showing the biphasic life cycle, and I'm reactivating the virus in a latently infected cancer cell, and I'm using a drug to wake it up because it's not in a human being. It's not um, like actual human samples. And um, when it's being reactivated and woken up, again, it's, it's making more of itself to go on and infect other cells where it may become dormant or may become activated again and make more of itself. So how I did this was I took this cell line called Trex BCBL3 flag RTA, which is just another word <laughs> for PEL cells. It's a specific type of PEL cell that we use that has a um, gene in it that is dependent on a drug that we add to the cells. So if I add this drug or this chemical doxycycline to the cells, it removes a repressor or something that prevents the virus from being reactivated. It removes it and allows the virus to become activated or wake up. And so what I did was I used these dormantly infected cells, added doxycycline or a drug to wake them up, and then harvested um, protein samples, so to do Western blot, and then RNA samples to look at genes to see what happens with my expression level of my gene to see what happened to my protein ID2, like when or how or why does KSHV um, downregulate this protein. And this is what I saw. So when you reactivate these latently infected cells, um, the first protein and the first, like the first protein and the only protein that's responsible for turning on and causing the rest of the virus to reactivate is this protein RTA. If you don't have RTA, the virus won't be able to wake up. It can't do anything. It'll stay dormant. Um, so when I added the drug, by six hours, the most important protein in the virus was being transcribed and turned into a protein, which meant that all the other genes were able, all the other genes or DNA in the virus were able to be transcribed, so that the virus is able to make more of itself. But by the minute that this protein RTA was being expressed my protein ID2 was completely gone, um, which was what we expected because we saw at the gene level that this was happening, but we wanted to confirm that it was happening at the protein level. So once we saw this, our next question was, what happens to KSHV um, when ID2 is overexpressed? So what happens to the virus if I add so much ID2 that it's not able to get rid of it? Like, will the virus be able to still replicate? And what we, and this is how I did this. So I used a virus called a lentivirus um, that expressed my protein, so that had a code, a DNA code in it for ID2. And when you infect with the PEL cells with this virus, it causes them to make a ton of my protein, so a ton of ID2. Um, and then after a couple of days of adding, like, a, like brute forcing the cells to make a ton of ID2, 
I used the drug doxycycline to wake the virus up in the same latently infected cells and look to see what happened. Um, so when we overexpressed the virus, um, ID2 was able to stay constant. So instead of being rapidly downregulated in wild types, so what usually happens when there's no overexpressed ID2, and what happens when there is overexpressed ID2, ID2 was not downregulated, it wasn't gone, but RTA was still able to be expressed. So that's telling me right away that the virus is still able to at least start reactivating. Um, but one thing that I did notice was this protein called K8.1. And all you need to know is that this protein is really important in virion assembly. So it's really important in making new virus particles. So when we saw that K8.1, this protein that's responsible for making more viruses, was being downregulated when I had a ton of my protein ID2 present in the cells. Yes, sorry. So these proteins are, yes, controls, but they're also there to see whether or not, to see whether or not when you use ID2 overexpression, if any part of the virus reactivation is inhibited. So when KSHV is reactivated, there's like three different phases that happen. There's this immediately er immediate early phase, then an early phase, and then a late phase. So I chose a protein from each phase to see if one phase was affected when I overexpressed this protein. So RTA is an immediate early. So when I saw that RTA expression was not affected, I as assumed it wasn't the immediate early part of the reactivation that was being affected. Then I chose an early protein of the virus called Aura 45. Um, and it slightly reduced, but it didn't really seem to affect the early phase as well. But when I looked at the late phase, K8.1, it was a pretty dramatic reduction of the protein from regular, like no overexpressed ID2 to overexpressed ID2. So it kind of led to the idea that maybe ID2 is preventing the virus from being assembled further. So now what I'm doing is just invest investigating how ID2 is downregulated, so what's causing the protein to be downregulated. Um, and what happens if we remove ID2, like if I take the protein away, does the virus automatically wake up or does it still need to be induced by a drug? Um, and then does ID2 prevent reactivation in other herpes viruses? So if I do a chicken pox, like the var varicella zoster, or if I do herpes simplex virus one, if I overexpress ID2, does that affect the virus? I don't know. So that's what we're working on in my lab now. But just in summary, of my journey <laughs> and what I'm doing now. Um, it has not been linear whatsoever. Um, and if you choose to do research, your journey will probably not be linear, and that's okay. <laughs> um, don't let any of them define who you are or tell you what you can or can't do. Um, if I had listened to people telling me that I was not able or capable of doing anything or uh, doing undergraduate, I would not be here. Um, and I would not have been given the opportunity of the Bridge to Baccalaureate or the Bridge to Doctorate program. Um, and don't be afraid to get out of your comfort zone. Um, it was very much so out of my comfort zone to move down to Florida, but it, is, it has been absolutely amazing and really just helped me grow as a researcher and as a person in general. Um, and find what you love. If you are really thinking of becoming a researcher or thinking that you might want to do research, get out there and try to find opportunities um, so that you can start to narrow down or start to figure out what you really like um, so that you end up doing something you love. So with that, I just wanted to acknowledge my lab, um, the Toth lab, and then the PAP lab that also helped produce the data that I show and um, the programs that I was a part of, so the Bridge to Baccalaureate prep program and the Bridge to Doctorate. So um, with that, I'll take any questions, and thank you for having me. Thank you.